Thank you to my patrons who are cool with me making whatever I want, including Alex Chablo, A Tree Outside, Beam Burst, Cam, Flugmorph, Gin Kotaku, Jack is Boy, Jalen, Rikafag, Rob, Seaweed Ambassador, and Tangoon. Hope you enjoy it, and thank you for stopping by. Watch Ojimajo Dorimi has become sort of a running joke for those of us who've taken the dive, and some have already answered the call, which is great. There's never been a better time to watch it. They're celebrating its 20th anniversary with a brand new movie with returning staff that was recently announced. I'd say it's the best anime that's still impossible to watch legally. At least you can read Monster legally. If it looks remotely familiar, it's cause it used to run on 4Kids, but only season 1, so... If you think you're a fan of this show from that by itself, you haven't seen anything yet. I'm not even saying best magical girl show, though that point could probably be argued for. It's the only series I'm aware of that takes the team dynamic of contemporary Maho Shoujo, but replaces the weekly monsters with coming of age slice of life like classic Maho Shoujo. A best of both worlds, if you will. The show has tremendous staff behind it, like director Takuya Igarashi, who's the reason why you loved Oron Host Club so much. It's got Yoshihiku Umakoshi Designs, whose talent you might be appreciating in Hero Academia. Not anymore! And it's got episode direction by guys like Junichi Sato, Shikeyasu Yamauchi, and Mamoru freaking Hosoda. I wonder if a guy made a video on that. I'm pretty upset it's looking like I'm the first anime YouTuber to make a video talking about the whole series, but I think I get why that is. It's perfection! What else is there to say about it? I mean, I can think of at least six. There's a lot to praise and discuss with this series, and while I want to discuss all of it, I'm not at the point where I'm comfortable promising a multi-part video series. Yet. So I gotta boil it down to my favorite aspect, the characters. But even that's a broad subject with Dory Me. So I'm gonna narrow it down to the main six, but you see how long even that takes, so I hope you strap in and enjoy. Now, I'm going to spoil Ojimajo Dorimi quite a lot here. In fact, a lot of this video is going to be story regurgitation. You know, that thing YouTubers do where they just tell you the plot and that constitutes as valuable additive content. But the reason I want to do it this way, besides being an excuse to talk about Dorimi for like an hour, is because I know only a handful of you have seen the first season, never mind the fewer of you who've seen all of it. I feel like if people knew what this show does and what it becomes, they might begin to understand why it's so special and why all of us are recommending it and would be convinced to watch it. I can't just say it's really funny, really cute, really smart, and got me to cry. I mean, it is all those things, but details and examples are far more valuable, don't you think? I want to make a video that would have convinced me to get around to watching it sooner. But the question now is, who do I talk about first? I love all these girls so much. I could go alphabetically or by order of appearance, but I've devised the best order would be to imagine a race between all of them. And the order will be where each girl is likely to finish that race. It's still a very arbitrary order. Don't take it too seriously. But who else would come in first but the remarkable Seno Aiko. Aiko first came off to me as the blue one. And it only goes up from there, folks, but yeah, that by itself definitely set the bar pretty high for me. She comes in as a transfer student with this dope Kansai accent that I'm so happy that subs translate faithfully. Aiko is one of those talented, determined, capable people that can do anything they put their mind to. She's fast, physical, and loud when she wants to be, which is quite often as she isn't afraid to angrily rant about anything. She exudes such an infectious confidence, like a cool factor that spreads to members of her class. 
I mean, she plays the harmonica of all things. What else would you expect? But she's also one of those friendly cool people who hang out with nerds that write comics about them. That's a little weird when you put it like that, but that's what these girls do. And what's more is this cool, confident person is also a witch apprentice, which at least to me carries that tokusatsu aesthetic of the hard-boiled badass dude henshining into kind of a dorky outfit. And it really could have stopped there with most shows, as it usually does. She's the tomboy. We get it. Next. But that's where this show steps things up. Aiko is also one of the most reliable characters I've ever seen. And I'm not talking about that anime standard of reliability, someone who swoops in at the last minute to save the day. I mean just general dependability, someone who is there for her friends and supports them in any way she can, almost without fail. Being such a strong-willed person, you'd expect Aiko to be looking out for herself, but you'll never catch her doing that on the surface. Aiko will help everyone with their problems, while also figuring out her own responsibilities and somehow make it all work. This attribute of helping others isn't just some surface level nice girl trait. For Aiko, it's habitual. It's born out of having to help her single father with dinner and chores, since he's so busy with work. Now, her mom isn't dead like you'd first expect. Aiko's parents are divorced. <gasps> Aiko's. The reason is a mix of Aiko's grandfather not approving of her father, her mom and dad having conflicts with their jobs, and also a miscarriage. The details don't matter too much. I don't bring them up to be like, ooh, look you guys, this this show gets serious. That that's why you should watch it. That's the trap I admittedly fell into when starting this show. That's not why it's good. It's just to show that Ojimaja Doremi doesn't shy away from these problems. Aiko's parents aren't arbitrarily divorced. There's a lot more to it, and none of it is swept under the rug. Aiko is a strong person because she has to be. Having her parents split up really takes an emotional toll on her. She has to be determined to visit her mom, brave to even talk to her grandfather, responsible to support her dad, and motivated to try and bring all of them back together. That's a tall order for many 18-year-olds, never mind, what, 8 years old? I love this because it demonstrates that you can be this strong and confident and reliable and still have these personal problems. Whatever hardships you're dealing with, whatever your shortcomings, none of that defines who you are. What matters is how you face up to them. Now, Aiko is a good example of this, but not quite the way I've been painting it thus far. She is surprisingly good at hiding what she considers shortcomings. For example, never being able to swim, which is something she withholds from everybody and gets into trouble twice because of it. She doesn't want anyone bringing up her parents' divorce because she doesn't want people to pity her. The conflict already lingers in the back of her colossal forehead. She doesn't need anyone reminding her because realistically, there's not much she can do about it. Yeah, it's impressive she can shoulder this emotional strain as an eight-year-old, but she's still a kid. It's not that easy to bring divorced parents back together. It's not an instant fix like the movies. It's messy and stressful, and might not ever happen even if everyone involved cares about one another very much. Aiko's parents don't fully understand what their divorce is doing to her, and frankly, they're lucky she's dealing with it as well as she is, because she experienced some seriously traumatic things. And instead of doing something destructive to others or herself, Aiko's solution has been to just tough it out and not communicate what's bothering her. And what's worse is that all this time, the problem has been this close to a solution, by virtue of Aiko being a witch apprentice. At almost any time, she could have waved a wand and forced her parents to make up. But messing with people's thoughts is one of the few things you aren't allowed to do with magic. Or else, depending on the severity, really terrible things can happen. And she comes close, way too close to crossing that line. But even if there wasn't this life-threatening consequence for using magic, I'm sure Aiko still would have regretted that choice forever. Because it's not real. It wouldn't be genuine. Her strength, in spite of that weakness, that temptation, is remarkable. But yeah, 
back in the point of her just being a tomboy. While she does show off these boyish qualities like being athletic, acting friendly with boys, and willing to get dirty, I love how that never gets in the way of her femininity. She isn't that cliché tomboy who acts uncomfortable wearing a dress. In fact, she rocks it. With the rest of the Ojimajo, she develops skills in baking, floristry, weaving, and craftsmanship, and being an excellent mother, too. Now, those things are not just for girls, mind you, parenthood included. But neither are those so-called boyish qualities like athletics and dirt just for boys. The idea that Aiko is capable of both, not just fitting into one or the other, goes a long way in breaking down gender norms. Her versatility is empowering, not just to women, but for everybody. To be fair, this theme doesn't just apply to Aiko or the other Ojimajo. This is shown with other members of the supporting cast, too. I just think Aiko is one of the clearest examples of this. I want to mention this scene in the last season that also highlights this versatility. <laughs> Now, given what we perceive of Aiko on the surface, besides being the blue one, you'd think the prince's role would be what suits her. But I love that we see the opposite instead. Aiko, through no fault of her own, has had to play the prince much of her life, leading and guiding her own circumstance. When she finally gets what she's worked and stressed over for so long, I was so happy to see Aiko being treated like a princess, being led into a dance with someone else. I think it's important for young girls, and by extension everyone of all ages, to feel like they are capable of playing either role, a prince and a princess. Okay, okay, second place in this fictional race would probably go to Asuka Momoko. How on earth do you introduce a new member to the team season three after spending a hundred episodes with the other five and still make her memorable and impactful and good? Hello, my name is Momoko Asuka. I just came back from the States a week ago. Oh, you have her speak perfect English. I'm glad you're next to me. Please help me whenever I need a help, okay? Yep, that'll do it. I'm sold. She's a transfer student, wait a minute, from America. That's also a former witch apprentice that joins the Ojimajo in their third attempt at becoming witches. One of the best subtleties to Momoko early on is how gradually she has to warm up to the group and her surroundings. She's nice, but not totally comfortable yet. The chemistry is not instant. She kind of butts heads with some of the cast at first. She's understandably in defensive mode, being in totally new surroundings with a whole language barrier to parse through. Yeah, she's not one of those foreign anime characters that happens to know English, but pretty much only speaks Japanese. For the first couple episodes, Momoko hardly knows any. And that's not something the show tries to gloss over. She genuinely has a hard time with complicated phrases and casual talking speeds. There's a couple miscommunications early on that cause conflict. And when she speaks English, the show doesn't use Japanese subtitles like most anime do when they use English. We are at the AVC station. I was already Because if the characters don't understand what she's saying, why should the Japanese speaking audience at home? She has to use an intercom built into their uniforms to communicate with the group, until she gradually learns Japanese. It's like the show is warming the audience up to Momoko as the characters warm up to her. But even through that colder exterior, we're able to see glimpses of a pretty awesome person. Gradually, her character blossoms into probably the most charming member of the cast. 
Momoko is so stylish and energetic and goofy, she fits in seamlessly with the rest of the group. The writers sort of borrowed a personality trait from each of the other girls and gave them to Momoko. She's a bad test taker like Dorimi, gets scared and laughs at terrible jokes like Hazuki. <laughs> She's athletic and gung-ho like Aiko, and is really amicable and hardworking like Anpu. This gives her a sense of chemistry with each of the girls, on top of having her own individual qualities. Like, since she's lived in New York for much of her life, Momoko gets extra excited for any Japanese culture. She's like a wholesome weeaboo. Ooh! It's Japanese traditional! <laughs> I think this is a fun character trait I've almost never seen, at least not to this extent. Because tell you the truth, I would probably feel the same way Momoko does about these things, and it's interesting to see how a native Japanese person would interact with this behavior. It tastes a little bit bitter, but oishi, I like it. Besides that, of course, Momoko is very forward-thinking and strong in her convictions. When she's asked to take a piercing off because it's against school dress code, or when her friendship with a girl is questioned because her friend is black, uh, yeah, that happens. She fiercely stands up for her feelings in the face of opposition. Now, sometimes this conviction has unintended hiccups, like when she wants to become one of Hana's mamas, even when she doesn't fully understand what has to come with that right away. It can also be very easy for Momoko to make snap judgments of people. She decides quick whether she likes somebody or not. But early on she realizes that everyone is different and has their own stuff to deal with. So even when someone is bullying her, she doesn't stoop to their level and is the first one to make friends with them. Making friends is a valuable trait to Momoko because she wouldn't be who she is if nobody did that for her. See, Momoko wasn't born in the US. Being a stranger with a language barrier is something she's already gone through before, only even younger. She was actually born in Japan and moved to New York when she was five. And it's tough to imagine the mental and emotional strain to be put in that situation when you're an adult. Never mind half that age. Never mind half that age. It was impossible for her to make any friends at the time. She was totally cut off. But who should come to help her in such a time? but a witch. So, at least in my experience, witches as a fictional construct have always been painted with a negative stigma. They're seen as wicked, self-serving, they're a pretty dangerous mob in Minecraft, and freaks of nature, cause you know, they're kind of immortal. But you've probably seen The Wizard of Oz, there are such things as good witches, as is mostly the case in this show. In this show, witches lived among humans for hundreds of years, and were inclined to help humans since they didn't have to worry about taking care of themselves as much. It's kind of a long explanation as to why that stopped, but now, if a human discovers a witch is a witch, she's cursed and turns into a magic frog. So the question then becomes, why would any witch take the risk of even living in the human world, let alone go out of their way to befriend a human? This is something that warrants an entire video on its own, but what matters right now is that it happened. Momoko befriends Majo Monro, who acts essentially like her grandmother for close to five years, helping to teach Momoko English and how to bake and so she can grow up living a normal life. That is, until Momoko inevitably discovers Majo Monroe's secret, which turns her into a magic frog. And so Momoko trains to become a witch, so she can undo the curse. Only when she finally does, it's too late. Momoko to yeah, I, I did say witches are only kinda immortal. Majo Monroe passes away, and since her existence has been a secret to everyone else in Momoko's life, she's left to grieve by herself. 
Is there anyone that close to you in your life that nobody else knows about? Well, not likely. But just try to imagine if that somebody suddenly died and you couldn't tell anyone about it. I sure can't, that would tear me up. But right as that happens, Momoko is then forced into moving to a totally different country where she's about to face the same feeling of isolation that Maja Monroe saved her from the first time. Thank goodness there happen to be witch apprentices where she's going, who she can not only become friends with, but also confide to them her lost loved one. Momoko never fully escapes her past. She's always missing her friends back in America, and deep down she wishes none of this ever happened and she could still be learning from Majo Monroe. This is something I think everyone can relate to one way or another, yearning for the past instead of embracing the present, even if your life is better now than it was before. There's a boy in their class that's building an aircraft that he calls Stay Gold, based on this novel he reads. We actually see Momoko reading a passage from this novel, yearning for a past that ended bitterly. The resolution was not to pine for or recapture those days, but instead to not forget those days when we believed we could fly. Momoko grows attached to her new surroundings and makes lasting friendships, to where by the time she has the choice to go back to America, she can't make an easy decision. But in staying true to herself, she resolves to take the next step in her life and to never forget the time she spent with her fellow witches. Next up is the magnificent Segawa Onpu, who I'm under the impression was almost the titular character. Yeah, the show is almost called Ojimajo Onpu. And who could blame them? She's perfect! I knew going into this show that Onpu would be the Green Ranger of sorts. Starts out as an antagonist, but turns good later on. I pulled up the episode where she makes her debut like, oh boy, here we go. With this jerk. <laughs> Oh no, I really like her already! One of the most magical things this show pulled off for me was how they got me to totally fall for Ampu in spite of that antagonistic context. You'd expect her to be kind of a catty, unlikable know-it-all that causes a bunch of problems for the girls, but they really take the high road with her character, not making her arbitrarily popular with all the boys, but genuinely charming and cool to where she actually deserves that attention. It's weird, cause she almost is kind of a know-it-all, or at least has the ego of one, but that ego is grounded in friendliness. Like, oh, well, at least she's super nice about it. And whether you consider that friendliness fake or real, it's still pretty convincing. She isn't framed as a threat, just a new wrench thrown in the cogs to shake things up. The girls don't come to see Ampu as some kind of rival to be avoided, but just another classmate, as would make sense realistically. She casually treats the girls as friends, even after they find out she's working for another witch that, earlier in the show, took their store hostage and screwed them over. But it's funny because Ampu doesn't take that vendetta all that seriously like you'd first expect. She cancels out a negative trait with another. She's unmotivated to really shoot others down because she's too selfish to care. I don't call Ampu selfish lightly. The word has such a negative connotation, but it really does fit her self-centric priorities. Like, how can you hate this girl when she says, yeah, I'm supposed to be here to mess you up, but I'm just gonna go shopping instead. I'll see you in class tomorrow. The selfishness doesn't stick out, which makes it digestible. I think where selfishness becomes obnoxious is when it mixes with boastfulness. 
One of the most prominent ensemble members in the cast is Tamaki Reika, who has a great character arc on her own, but one thing that never goes away is her boastful attitude, which amplifies her own self-serving interests. So she comes off a lot more obnoxious, at least to the other characters, than Anpu does. Instead, Anpu gives off that radiant energy that you can feel like when you meet a celebrity you look up to. Because Anpu literally is a celebrity. She's a professional child actress and idol, but she isn't just wildly talented. Because she's in show business, Anpu's maturity is accelerated. She doesn't act like a third grader. It's all work and very little play. She's pretty much a workaholic, and that's partly why she cruises through the Witch Apprentice exams faster than Doremi and the others. <laughs> I can somewhat attest to this as a theater person myself. What we do as actors is fun, but takes serious discipline, focus, patience, and hard work. Not just to do the job, but to keep finding work. Doing what Ampu does isn't easy, and she's fortunate to have her mom manage most of it, but it's still Ampu that has to show up and work for it. The craft has to keep being sharpened and improved, or you'll fall behind. And the business can be really unforgiving sometimes. Just because you killed it at your last job, doesn't mean you're guaranteed the next job. You have to keep hearing no hundreds of times for the chance you hear yes once. To be kept in this cycle for a couple of years before we first meet Anpu, her personality fits. She is no-nonsense, habitually polite, and takes advantage of any exploit possible. Of course she's selfish. She's an actor. And remember, being selfish isn't all bad. But giving a person like Anpu something like magic? is powerful, and giving that person a charm that can absorb the consequences of forbidden magic is dangerous. <laughs> if Anpu can influence people's thoughts to sustain her career or get ahead, she'll do it. It's not that she isn't strong enough to get by without magic, but given the immense pressure she's under, it's no wonder she uses it that way. And it's not framed maliciously. She isn't residing in her own ego, laughing at her own cleverness, when any other show would do that otherwise. Ampu's voice actor happens to play this exact character in Ashita no Naja. But regardless of how her character acts, self-serving magic in this way presents an interesting contrast with being a witch. Because as said earlier, Witches aren't nearly as selfish. Yes, magic can be used to help yourself, but there's even more fulfillment found in using magic to help others. There's a scene where Anpu is going to have steak with green peppers for dinner, and she hates green peppers. So she uses magic to manipulate her mother into eating out instead. Up until that point, Anpu had only used forbidden magic for significant situations, winning an idol contest, accidentally getting seen, but this was very petty in comparison. It wasn't worth using forbidden magic for. That small choice hints at this becoming a habit, and that's what makes it forbidden. But the shift from using magic selfishly to selflessly is so gradual I didn't fully understand at first watch, and would warrant its own video to explain, but I'll just share the piece that stuck out to me. Ampu is faced with another audition, which she needs to settle quick so she can see her father on time, who's not home due to being a train conductor. But she takes sympathy for a girl who desperately wants to act in the same drama as her passed on father. She ends up getting stage fright, but instead of leaving her be and securing the role herself, Ampu once again uses forbidden magic to cure this girl's nervousness. This completely depletes her of magic, the girl ends up winning the audition, and Ampu misses the train to see her father. This could have very well been the clincher for Anpu to never put anyone before herself ever again. But instead, the Ojumajos come in clutch and she's able to see her father. Doing good is like a boomerang. So long as you throw it the right way, it always comes back. Ampu finally learns that, 
but not before she kicks the habit and suffers the consequences of casting any magic she wants. But remarkably, I've only talked about her so far in the context of Season 1, over two-thirds deep into Season 1, when she's only a supporting character. Naturally, she's a fully-fledged Otomajo the rest of the show. She's still a busy actress, and I love that they show her work ethic to back that up. They never skimp out on Ampu having a busy schedule, often omitting her from scenes or whole episodes due to her being at work. But she still shows up as often as she can at the shop, always present for important witch-related events, and takes care of Hana as much as everyone else. Remember that time she used forbidden magic just to avoid eating green peppers? Two seasons later, Hana is also confronted with eating green peppers. But she'll lose her magic unless she eats them. Anpu realizes the hypocrisy in forcing her daughter to eat something she's unwilling to eat herself. So she eats green peppers right in front of Hana, almost making herself sick just to get Hana to eat them. She's like that really cool friend you can't believe wants to be friends with you. I personally relate to that a lot. It's so refreshing to have someone like her in this group that's otherwise a bunch of goofballs. She carries such an elegant poise to her, it creates this hilarious contrast when something silly happens. She makes those same crazy faces even though it seems like something lowbrow for her. She shows this hesitation around things that are improper for a lady. But I love when she embraces that and even encourages the wackiness. Like this recurring trend where Majorico gets really into samba dancing, and Ampu finds it really fun and turns everyone into samba dancers. And she's cool with that, because it's in the witch world where there's no paparazzi that could make a stink out of it. She revels in this environment where she can express herself, have fun, and best of all, be treated like a regular person. The grind can really be like that. The business almost requires you to be completely immersed in it. And that deprivation of normal life is totally believable. Again, reinforced by the show's commitment to omitting her every so often. <laughs> But this leads Ampu to ultimately lose sight of herself. Like, what is she even doing this for? It was for her mom at first, but she slowly realizes her sense of identity got warped because of her job. She's easily the most put-together character, yet holds all these insecurities about herself, just like the rest of us not-famous people. Why does she work this hard? When did she lose that wide-eyed innocence she once had? And what is she going to do about it? Ombu's struggle with growing up and becoming jaded to something you were once passionate about is something everyone has to wrestle with. Some handle it better than others, but I think just settling with what you're good at doesn't encourage growth. Ampu has more growing to do. This isn't the end, and her passion is transformed into a pursuit that will take her to new places and new experiences, not in service of finding something but to indulge in the chase of growth. <laughs> Next one to finish, it's close, but I'll give it to Hana. Yeah, we're gonna talk about the baby. That's kind of nuts, isn't it? How many baby characters do you know of? Not child characters, not the Rugrats, infants that aren't just plot devices, accessories, or like prizes. There's a couple, but it's not something you see every day. I think it's because it's difficult with babies to make out those details that make a character distinctive because babies almost unilaterally act the same way. They laugh, they cry, they poop. They can't talk, 
they hardly move. And let's face it, if your baby character has a fully developed brain, is it really a baby at that point? It can be risky to center your entire show around a baby because if done poorly, it's gonna get tedious and obnoxious pretty quick. I'll be honest in saying I loved season one, but was apprehensive of the conceit of the girls having to take care of a baby in season two. The whole thing seemed like a huge gimmick, a jumping the shark moment. Little would I know how integral Hana would be to Ojimajo Dorimi leveling up from just cute and fun to a powerful coming of age saga. Dorimi Sharp is a pretty rocky season. Not because it's boring or bad or anything like that. There's just a lot of growing pains. There's more arguing, higher stakes, there's a troop of boys trying to flirt with them, and less fun, which is in stark contrast to season one. And most of these circumstances are caused by Hana, but what saves her from the blame is how it's only her fault unintentionally. Because of course it is, she's a baby. But this shift in tone is actually really important to the growth of these characters. It's the first time they have to take serious responsibility. Raising a child takes patience, persistence, and diligence. And it's reflected here as the most stressful, uncomfortable period of the series. It's like we're roughing it out with them. But it's also the most rewarding experience, as I'm sure any parent would tell you. You get to see a person grow right in front of you, witnessing their firsts and celebrating the milestones. Only what's great about that is how digestible and easy it is to track here, by tying Hana's development directly to the story progression. Every season of Ojimacho Dorimi loosely structures itself around a series of trials that the girls must pass to become real witches. And in this season, it's health exams for Hana's maturation. The audience gets to see Hana become her own character, and like much of the series, the progress is gradual, but consistent. I never thought I could enjoy the presence of a baby character until I met Hana. Despite being a witch baby that floats sometimes, somehow this show demonstrates the experience of taking care of a baby so authentically and earnestly. This is largely because the show doesn't skimp out on the not so glamorous parts. Hana acts like a pretty normal baby. She laughs, she cries, she poops. But because she also has a high level of magic, she can cause unpredictable trouble too. Thankfully, this isn't a normal thing babies do, but not only does it keep things interesting and fresh, it also never detracts from the authenticity of Hana's behavior. Cause yeah, this is probably what would happen if a baby had this kind of power. But while it doesn't detract from her behavior, it does seem to influence it. This might just be a thing babies normally do, but in all these wacky experiences, through her fault or not, she gains a lot of interest in the strange and dangerous. She wanders off a lot more than most babies, gets excited when things get out of control, and has this bizarre but devastatingly charming fondness for Oyajide, the show's resident wizard pervert. I really get a kick out of that last one. The contrast is just adorable. But this manages to disarm the audience from taking frustration with Hana. If she were getting herself into bad situations and crying hysterically over it, that would come off as pretty irritating. Instead, Hana isn't just an authentic acting baby, nor just a plot device, but an engaging character in her own right and a core member of the group which makes it all the more painful when she has to be separated from them for a portion of season three. That stings. That really stings. We don't get nearly as much of Hana in this season, but what we do get is just as worth discussing. Not only is she way cuter now because she starts talking a little bit, she shows the most exciting developments to her personality. First, it's compelling to see Hana take a dislike to things and pushing back on them. Her conflicts before were usually by accident or by virtue of being a baby, 
but even if it's just vegetables, having to actually convince Hana to do something makes for pretty engaging conflicts. And second would be this. <laughs> Hana has adopted some of her mama's traits, particularly altruism. She uses her magic to help the other babies and become almost a leader to them. Probably my favorite scene with her in the whole show is when one of the babies are crying missing their mama and Hana makes their mama appear. Then all the babies cry missing their mamas and Hana brings them over. It's super emotional and it basically obliterates that arbitrary rule of mamas never being allowed to see their babies. But what's special about this was that she brought everyone else's mama before thinking of herself, only to break down later and teleport her own mama afterward. But that idea of the baby really taking after the people who raised them is immensely satisfying. And the best part is, we don't even have to wait to see what Hana would be like at Dorimi's age. Season 4 throws yet another tired gimmick at us and nails it again! And yeah, if you were wondering this whole time how a baby could beat two of these girls in a race, yeah, there's your reason. It's kind of surreal watching Hana talk and take action when she's been a baby all this time. The writers succeed at this tricky balance of Hana having the intelligence of a 6th grader with the maturity of a 2 year old. She still keeps a lot of her established personality, empathizing with others, her stubbornness, an affinity for chaos. But all of these are cranked up to 11 now that she's, well, 11. Oh, <laughs> she's a wild card running headfirst into a situation and giving the Ojimajo frequent heart attacks. And it's delightful. Her wide-eyed innocence is very refreshing in a group of otherwise seasoned vets. The girls have gone through a lot at this point, and Hana pushes the envelope of being a witch in ways they never dared to. It's not always a good idea, but if Hana never made mistakes, she'd never be able to learn from them. Her liberal use of magic in this season is also part of a balancing act, since the rest of the girls are subconsciously relying on magic less and less. So it's Hana's imagination and abundant use of magic that carries that element in the final season. All of this growth and experience is in service to something. Unlike the other girls, Hana has a very concrete destiny in front of her. She is to be the successor to the queen of the witch world, and be a leader in potentially joining the two worlds back together again someday. Hana represents the future, and while the whole magic thing isn't our reality, she's still a reflection on the kind of future we should strive for. One that gratefully always comes. A new generation. Wide-eyed and full of ambitious energy. I'd connect this to her being named Hana after the Japanese word for flower, but it's not coming. Jeez. Coming in not last, at least, is the only Ojimajo not allowed to say fuck. <laughs> Hazuki Fujiwara is so precious, I want to protect her at all costs. But I say that because I'm not the only one. Her family is pretty wealthy, and her mom dotes on her a lot. I'm bringing this up first because this shapes almost her entire character. You can trace most of Hazuki's qualities to the fact she's overly sheltered by her parents. Though I'd like to point out her parents aren't bad people for this. It makes sense for parents to do anything they can for their children. As such, Hazuki is, for one thing, raised very well. She's polite, courteous, studious, <laughs> Yes, you have to do good stuff. 
and talented in things like swimming, dancing, and playing the violin. I love that she never boasts about any of these talents. In fact, we don't learn how good a swimmer she is till three seasons in. Of course, those talents don't just come with the skill, but with the work ethic too. Despite being pampered, Hazuki is a hard worker. In fact, she's excited to work for the Mahodo because it gives her the chance to contribute and achieve something rather than having it handed to her. And this mixes in great with her cognition, solving problems in creative and inventive ways. And not only that, her ability to acquire knowledge doesn't just improve Hazuki's intelligence, but her social awareness as well. She knows how to read a room and identify what someone is feeling, even if she has yet to find out why. And this, I think, is her best trait, once she identifies those feelings. It's like her entire being commits to act on them. Her heart is huge, and that could be seen as a generic compliment, so let me back it up. Hazuki's huge heart frequently goes out to Masaru, the school's delinquent bad boy who plays the trumpet. She stands this boy more than anybody in season 1, refuses to believe the nasty false rumors, and takes action by skipping class to go find him. Then, in the very next episode, this one girl in their class is afraid of animals because her pet dog was run over and killed, so Hazuki gives this girl a bunny to take care of to help her overcome that. But the rabbit is attacked and is injured really badly, so the girl lashes out on Hazuki. This moves Hazuki to cross a line and use forbidden magic to heal the rabbit, which inflicts the wound on herself. That should have killed her! She's lucky to be alive! Alive enough to appear in the next episode after that, where she's kidnapped at gunpoint! This is all in Season 1. <laughs> but unlike probably any of the other Ojimajo, she doesn't panic. She has small talk with the kidnappers, helps them write her own hostage letter for them, gives them advice with the kidnapping, and responds to their comedy act with support, laughing at it. Yeah, I, I think that might be my favorite trait of hers. Hazuki's sense of humor is just awful. She just laughs at really bad puns and cold zingers from the SOS trio. <laughs> It's the only trait I don't think I can trace back to her family. Anyway, those are three totally different circumstances, but she proves how big her heart is in every one and more so. These are incredibly positive qualities for a character. Dare I say, perfection? She'd make it pretty far in life if not for the one thing holding her back. It's very challenging for Hazuki to put her feelings into words and express them. It's something you might have already expected from this shy-looking girl. That's probably her most surface-level trait. What with her conservative-looking appearance, her voice that sounds like it could break into a million pieces. <laughs> or when we see how much of a scaredy cat she can be. Which is ironic, since she's a witch apprentice who sees weird stuff all the time. But getting to know her, it's not that she's timid around people. In fact, she reaches out to people pretty frequently. And when it comes to voicing her opinion about other people's problems, she's the most vocal one in the group. <laughs> the nail gets hit pretty squarely on the head when she fights with Dorimi. <laughs> Expressing her own wants and feelings is what she's most self-conscious about, and it starts with her mother. Again, her mother isn't some wicked or unreasonable stereotype. She's actually really nice, which is what makes her so hard to refuse. Hazuki wants autonomy, to choose for herself. But she also loves her mother and doesn't want to make her sad, which she's done in the past whenever she expresses what she wants. <laughs> that fear of saying the wrong thing leads to all sorts of problems for her. One of my favorites is when she's elected to be the play director for her class, which I strongly relate to as someone who's directed plays before. 
the job isn't so much directing as it is about making choices. A director could make every last decision about a show, but not only might they get totally burnt out from doing that, it stifles creativity from everyone else working on it. It's up to the actors and creative team to make decisions, and the director's job to guide them all down the same path. Now, if Hazuki was a stage manager, she'd probably really thrive because that's all about making sure things get done, and she's spectacular at acting on another's behalf. However, being the director herself puts her in so many situations where she has to make a decision based on what she wants, and she completely falls apart because she doesn't want to make the wrong choice and make people upset with her. In the end, Hazuki remembers she's supported by her friends, even when your lead actor quits last minute and you have to take their place, which also happened to me. But I think what makes this very interesting is that this mental block actually saves her sometimes. If it was too easy for her to express what she was feeling, like Momoko, that fear she has of hurting other people might really happen. There's a girl in their class that keeps getting very sick and often misses school. So of course, members of her class come to visit her every so often. In fact, Hazuki does her homework. But Hazuki actually gets jealous of this sick girl because Masaru is visiting her every day. Like, that's the guy she likes, but he's spending time with this sick girl. It's completely platonic, but she can't help but feel that, and yeah, it's kind of messed up. She manages to sort it out in her head that the other girl is just lonely and Masaru is just being a kind friend. But imagine if Hazuki expressed how she felt, how devastating that might be to their relationship. I can't praise this show enough for going there with its characters, putting them in such uncomfortable situations and letting that stew. Though. That's not even the best example of Hazuki's struggle with self-expression. That credit belongs to Mamoru Hosoda's episode, which I'd love to dedicate an entire video talking about it. So I'll just say for now that here, unlike the play where it's very clearly safe to express herself, and the sick girl where it's very clearly unsafe to express herself, this is the episode where nothing seems to be clear. And it's harrowing. She has so much heart, it almost crushes her. I really thought out of everyone in the group, Hazuki would end up being my favorite, just because I'm especially partial to obviously flawed but endearing characters. But it wouldn't be right of me if I didn't save the best for dead last. <laughs> Coming in dead last because she tripped several times and got lost along the way would be the world's most unluckiest pretty girl, Harukaze Dorimi. Dorimi is a hot mess. She's plagued with clumsiness, often making mistakes and eating sh. She's habitually lovesick, fawning after boys when it's usually a bad idea. <laughs> but of course the one guy that actually likes Dorimi is also her greatest rival. Oh, and he brings out another quirk to her. She's got quite the temper. typically from being the butt of so many jokes. <laughs> the 
This girl can be so dense sometimes, she even forgets her own birthday. As I've mentioned before, Doremi is also a woefully poor student, earning bad grades and getting scolded by her teacher all the time. Oh, I relate to this one a lot, actually. Doimi is also quite loud and says really dumb things. Yeah, definitely talks far too much. Last, and perhaps most hilariously, she is very susceptible to steak. It's her passion, her weakness, the sun she orbits around. Even when it seems she has only ever eaten steak once in her life. And she always misses her chance to eat it again. <laughs> Gets me every time. No matter which way you look at it, Majorica is pretty much doomed to be a magic frog forever. It's crazy to compare Dorimi to the rest of her friends in the group and see how different she is to them. Everyone else is so talented, while anything Dorimi makes for the Mahodo is awful and sells terribly. The most she can do is play the piano, but everyone else plays an instrument, and besides, she doesn't play too often anymore. Her little sister Pop gets much better at it. Pop is better than Dorimi at a lot of things, actually. She's smarter, more mature, and actually goes out on dates. Dorimi doesn't even have a clue of what she wants to do with herself when she grows up, when all of her other friends have plans and futures for themselves. So, the question now becomes, why is she the titular character? I mean, the original title was Ojumaju Anpu. She's obviously the goofball side character that everyone keeps around because she's funny, right? Well, no, that's not why. Though, yes, she is really funny. Yeah, <laughs> It isn't so much that they keep her around, but rather that they all gravitate towards her. It's very strange, actually. All these talented, amicable, cool, fun, smart, 
beautiful girls decide to spend much of their youths following and hanging out with this ordinary, unlucky, dorky, useless oaf? Why? Because she's literally the greatest friend in the world. It never matters to Doremi who someone is or who she is in relation to that person. She makes friends with everyone. In spite of her vast arsenal of shortcomings, none of them get in the way of her likability and love of people. Doremi's enthusiasm, humor, and joy is infectious. It's no wonder these girls want to be around her. She impacts each of their lives so profoundly. While they are all friends with each other, I'm sure every last one of them would single out Doremi as their best friend. Aiko wouldn't have the resolve and support in reuniting her family without Doremi. She's the prince to all other prince characters. Momoko was about to go through the same loneliness she felt in New York again. Her first friend was Dorimi. That puts Dorimi on the same plane as Momoko's own mentor. Ampu has all these fans and opportunities open to her, but her sense of identity and need for human connection would have never been satisfied if it wasn't for Dorimi reaching out and being her friend. I honest to God thought the show's resolution to where Dorimi was supposed to be when she grows up was going to be her becoming a mother because she's excellent at it. There's a reason that Hana only calls for Dorimi that one time. Oh, and Hazuki is not only as comfortable with expressing herself as she is because of her closest friend, but the whole reason she loves playing the violin and wants to pursue it to become a professional violinist is all because of that time she played it with Dorimi. She finds her calling in life thanks to this girl. Of course, these aren't the only characters Dorimi makes an impact on. A bulk of the show centers around different classmates of theirs, each episode centering around their own personal challenges. And it's most often Dorimi that motivates that focus. Probably the best example of this is her relationship to Kayoko, who is deathly afraid of going to school. She literally gets nauseous when she tries to enter the classroom, but Dorimi offers her own shirt to throw up on. This girl is physically willing to give the shirt off her back for a friend. And we can't forget about that Naisho episode when she makes friends with a terminally ill girl who wants to be a witch. I don't think I need to explain that one. You know exactly where that's going. I would go so far as to say there are actually no bad guys in this whole show. There are obstacles challenges, but there is no character that gets left behind on Dormi's watch. She loves Ampu and is willing to sacrifice her certification as a witch in order to save her. Dormi's the only one that really forgives and stays friends with the Flat Four, even after they manipulated her and her friends and steal her adoptive daughter. Dormi and her friends win over every last witch in the witch world, even the most feared and destructive witch of them all. They risk their lives not to get rid of her, but to save her. This is not a case of villains having a sympathetic past that validates their wickedness, only to have them exit the story when their role is fulfilled. These characters are legitimately redeemed and get to live in happiness, all thanks to the determination and love of this derpy, useless idiot. And all that doesn't have anything to do with the best part of her character. Why she's the titular character. Episode 1 features pretty much every one of Dorimi's characteristics, from the clumsiness to the stake. But our introduction to Dorimi shows off one more side to her character. Blah, blah, 
She's casting a spell to give her the courage to confess to a boy she likes. She's always wanted to be a witch because magic seemed like the only thing that can fix her problems as a person. See, she's completely aware of her clumsiness, irritability, lovesickness, addiction to steak, and her big fat mouth. And unlike Aiko, she doesn't try to hide any of it, mainly because she just can't. But even when she has all these friends, and they tell her how awesome she is, and how much she means to them. She just gets kinda embarrassed and brushes it off. She doesn't realize how special her ability to make friends is. It's like she considers it common. All she can seem to focus on are her flaws. And that's something I can relate to myself. I sell myself short all the time. Many of us can probably relate to only dwelling on our weaknesses instead of leaning into what makes each of us valuable. But when you're Doremi's age, you don't necessarily see what time and experience can do to your growth. So being the innocent, immature third grader that she is, being a witch seems like the answer. Of course, when she accidentally outs someone as a witch and has to become a witch apprentice, she takes it in stride, despite not being any good at it. She's the first witch in centuries to fail literally the easiest exam. She can't fly a broom to save her life at first, and even through season 3, she can't help but use magic to feed herself. That's what Ojimajo means in Japanese. She's a useless witch. But I've never seen any character to be more enthused about becoming a magical girl, or a mecha pilot, or anything an anime sets a character up to be, than Doremi becoming a witch apprentice. <laughs> She is <laughs> That's something Doremi did on the fly. And it's so earnestly corny, it not only melted me out of my chair when I first saw it, but all the other girls are just convinced that's part of the transformation, even adding their own dance moves to it later on. But anyway, anyway, now she has magic. The opening theme speaks for itself. If you had magic, what would you do? Life would be pretty great, right? That's the big question this entire show poses. And while they do impose limitations on this magic, because having no rules would be too boring, the answer becomes clearer as the show goes on. Magic is convenient, but there's more value in solving your problems, putting the work in to make something, forming human connections, and reaching a sympathetic understanding of the world on your own. Over the course of the show, Doremi and the rest of the girls lean less and less on using magic. By the last season, they only use magic when absolutely necessary. And when you start noticing that, you start to notice how less and less often you see these other debilitating traits from Doremi herself. The pouting fades away. She goes less and less crazy over steak. She's not screwing up as often. She's saying more and more insightful things, becoming a great mother, becoming a better sister, we watch her grow up to the moment where, by the end of the series, she's the one who represents the group in turning down the offer to become permanent witches. She is human and loves being who she is. And she loves the people around her, which she'd have to learn to let go of if she had the centuries long lifespan of a witch. She believes in magic, but chooses not to use it. Despite what you might be thinking, though, that's not how the show ends. Before the episode where they choose to let go of magic, it's revealed one by one that the six of them also have to let go of each other. Everyone is going their separate ways, moving on with their lives, chasing their dreams. Except for Doremi, of course, who still doesn't have a direction. Now, characters going their separate ways is just basic fiction. Graduating high school and everyone leaving for different colleges or graduating college and leaving for different jobs is a common step of life, one that we all have time 
to emotionally prepare for. The kicker with this instance is that they're only graduating elementary school. They all expected to stay in this group for another five or six years. Imagine your friend group realizing you aren't going to see each other anymore. Or at least not as often as you always have. And finding that out within the course of a month. It's a tough thing to confess to someone you have to leave them. When both of you care so deeply about each other. Especially when you promised that friend you'd never leave her. Hazuki-chan. <laughs> But the greatest friend on the planet handles it as well as you would expect. Full support and happiness for that person. And that person. And that person too. And literally your closest friend. Okay. And your figurative daughter. Gotcha. Gotcha. And you're graduating elementary school. Okay. Mm. That's, that's too much. Doremi can't take it. After all that progress, all that influence she had on two worlds and so many lives, she doesn't want to move on. She wants things to stay the way things are. But there's a bit of a problem with that plan. And it's that her world isn't moving on without her. Just like all those times she never left anyone behind, they're not going to leave her behind either. Little by little, she built something that is completely uncharacteristic of her. Something that will never trip under its own footing. Something that is bigger and more powerful than any magic. Something that will last as long as they live. More than saving the world, more than graduating elementary school. It is her greatest achievement. And because of that, she comes to finally realize what she really is all along. She is talented. She is special. She is loved. We see Doremi go from this klutzy, crying, adorkable mess into the world's happiest, luckiest pretty girl who can confidently confess to the guy she likes without magic, without fear with a smile. Arigato. Oh, fuck. <laughs> oh, God. I'm going to use some of those crying takes. That, sound, that came very naturally. Oh, God damn it.